Hello and welcome to the Corporate Facility Council's first Wednesday webinar, Reopening Child Care Centers Safely During a Pandemic, Lessons Learned and Best Practices, presented by Jonathan Durant, CFM, SFP, and FMP, and he is also with Google. I do want to let everyone know that they have been muted for audio quality. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please type them in the question box on your control panel. We'll be happy to go over them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. I also do want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, and a copy of the recording will be posted to the CFC's website, ifmacfc.org. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the Council's Secretary and Programs Chair, Wayne Witzel. Wayne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joshua, and uh, thank you once again, Joshua, for uh, helping us with these webinars and organizing everything. Uh, just a big shout out to the uh, components team there at HQ. You guys are so fantastic and have been such a big help during uh, these past couple of challenging years. So, uh, Joshua, it's uh, great to have you on the team here. Uh, welcome, everyone. I, I'm very excited about today's presentation. Of course, I always get excited about presentations because we have such wonderful people uh, in our council and, and speakers that come here. Um, I want to say that none of that would be possible if it were not for our uh, platinum sponsor, Tursano. Uh, and I should also say that Tursano uh, is going to be speaking on the science behind uh, aqueous ozone cleaning next month. So please sign up for that webinar. Um, I'll just personally tell you a story. I attended a seminar at Stanford University a couple of years ago uh, with uh, it was pretty much a who's who of FMs in the Silicon Valley and, and actually all of Northern California. And uh, Stanford has been using aqueous ozone now, I believe, for over eight years in about 600 buildings. Uh, it's their exclusive method for cleaning, and, and they even give it to the students to use. So I was so blown away with this, I asked these, uh, these folks at Tresano to come and talk with us, and we finally were able to, to nail something down. So I strongly encourage you with this new normal of, uh, of you know, people worried about their health and disinfection and so forth to really take a look at some things that are a little bit safer than some of the things I've seen uh, uh, being sprayed in, in uh, facilities in the past couple of years. So take a look at that. You can sign up for that on the uh, on the website. And again, Tersano, thank you for being a platinum sponsor for the Corporate Facilities Council. Uh, I'd also like to welcome members from the Academic Facilities Council who were invited to this uh, presentation as well, since there's some obvious crossover with some of the things that you, uh, you do as well. Uh, that will be available on the CFC website, as Joshua said, this recording, uh, but I will also make sure your, uh, your council leaders get a direct link and copy to it as well that they can distribute to your membership. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan. Um, I, I want to say, if, if anybody ever has a question about how uh, how one can grow and accelerate through a career in FM. I think Jonathan should be the poster child for that. Um, when you look at his credentials, obviously he has an FMP, an SFP, and a CFM, and has been uh, for you know, in facilities for 15 plus years with you know really good experience in different places throughout the United States, and obviously landed uh, here at Google. It's it's amazing to me that always where facilities, the career facilities, can take someone. And I strongly encourage everybody to uh, take a look at credentialing. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions about credentialing, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to talk with you about it. But obviously, we have tons of resources uh, available to you. So I, I encourage you to, to take a look at what IFMA has to offer in terms of the FMT uh, and CFM and SFP. And, and please reach out uh, to me or anyone at HQ if you have any questions about that. Um, Jonathan uh, and I were talking about uh, something you know, that we could present that is unique and something that uh, maybe not everybody has a child care center in their facility, right? This is a very you know, specific type of thing, but um, it's something that can be scalable. It, there are other options besides an actual child care center, but when you do have one, it's after speaking with Jonathan, there's a lot of challenges, <laughs> a lot of security and rigor that go around that. And I was just fascinated with, uh, with, with what he was telling me. So um, I've asked Jonathan to come in and talk with us about this and, and, and hopefully you, you gain some information from this. And I, I think even, you know, with safety and, and uh, uh, you know, safety being the number one thing that facility managers are charged with, uh, this is really the, the epicenter of that, right? Safety for our children. So I'm anxious to hear what you have to say, Jonathan. So with that, everyone, please welcome Jonathan Durant. Thank you, Wayne, and thank you, Joshua, and uh, thank you to the IFMA Corporate Facilities Council for, for having me today. So without further ado, um, again, Jonathan Durant, Regional Facilities Manager at Google. 
uh, and I'm here to talk about our what we call GCCs, our Google Child Care Centers, um, that we uh, run in conjunction with Cushman Wakefield, our trusted vendor partner. So uh, they they oversaw quite a bit of our uh, project management and uh, implementation of the rollout of the safety programs and the projects that we took that took place during uh, shutdown during COVID. So just kind of an overview that what we're going to be talking about today, um, the GCC campus overview, the project highlights, interior repair and maintenance work, HVAC upgrades, furniture refresh, and uh, the robust seismic project that we had to had to take uh, take on during COVID, and then returning safely uh, to the having the children return. Um, so we had to do quite a bit of quite a bit of cleaning up to CDC standards and then do health screenings and check-ins when, when uh, children and educators return to the schools. Okay, and here we are. So um, we have four schools in the, in the South Bay region. Um, two are owned and two are leased. Um, as you can see, it's uh, kind of spread out all over the region where our offices are located and most of our employees who we call Googlers are located. Um, so we have a you know, 6,000 square foot facility in Sunnyvale with about 46 children, uh, 34,000 square foot uh, facility in Mountain View with about 162 children. That's our largest school. School number three is in Palo Alto with about 16,000 square feet and 67 children. And last but not least, our fourth school is in Mountain View uh, with about 13,000 square feet and 65 children in enrollment. So as as the pandemic hit, you know, in March 2020, as everyone knows, we had a shutdown, and uh, the, the the issue that we had was we didn't know how long the schools would be shut down. Uh, during any routine year, we only have two weeks a year when they are actually closed for the holidays. They they are open 50 weeks a year, so it was very challenging to get in there to do any meaningful work um, during during regular time. So you know, kind of making, you know, taking lemons and, and making lemonade when COVID hit, we, we saw this as a, you know, as, a, as an opportunity to get in there and get a bunch of the repair and maintenance projects that we were deferring over the years. Um, however, we didn't know if it was going to be two, two weeks, two months, two years, obviously it turned out to be two years at this point. Um, so we, we incrementally went in and started doing some refreshes uh, in a piecemeal way, knowing that at any given moment they could you know, reverse course and, and open. So we had to be very methodical in the approach. Um, so we started kind of chipping away, um, you know, from Q2 all the way to Q4, we did um, a lot of low hanging fruit projects on the exterior of the building, you know, uh, paint refreshes, landscaping upgrades, uh, changed out some furniture, uh, you know, hand sanitizer stations, jungle gems, bird netting, tree trimming, a lot of stuff that we weren't able to do um, you know, while the, the building was, while all, all the buildings were uh, occupied. Now, when Q4 2020 came, we knew we were kind of in this for the long haul. Um, and so we started kind of digging in and trying to figure out what we can do uh, kind of more meaningful. So we started going into the interior of the buildings and doing paint refreshes, doing kind of more robust elevator cab refreshes, uh, upgrading dishwashers, garbage disposals, blinds, carpet flooring, all that fun stuff. And then on top of this, we had one building, school number two, that was, um, you know, slated to be seismically upgraded, and that was going to shut down the school for uh, six to eight months. And that was something that was put on the back burner. Uh, the building was deemed safe. It was, you know, up to standards for occup uh, occupancy and uh, city of Mountain View um, to allow it to operate. It was a nice to have project. Um, that we decided to take on with this opportunity of with the, the building shutdown. So we'll, that'll be my my final portion of this presentation because uh, it's a very robust robust project. And this was done in, in partnership with the CNW project management and facilities team for all four locations. So as you would imagine, the GCCs, any child care center is going to have some very specific requirements um, to not only perform work at, but to have staff and individuals be on site. So this required background checks for every single person that stepped foot on, on the property, whether you were a janitor, uh, you know, a, a plumber uh, or facilities manager, you had to go through uh, some, some background checks, TB testing, 
uh, for tuber uh, tuberculosis and fingerprints for everyone who's going to be on site. So that that adds a, a layer of complication and intricacy um, just right off the bat. Um, we also had to have additional security clearances through our uh, our internal uh, Google security team. So uh, we had to go through another layer of you know vetting and verification for all workers. And then anytime that we had to do any work, we had to do um, pre-approval with the the childcare operations team because as you know, there's there's a lot of moving parts with uh, childcare centers. You know, uh, even when we were closed, you still had teams coming back, um, organizing and and utilizing the space. So we had to make sure that we were upfront with all of our schedules with the with the teams, and uh, to make sure we didn't really step on their toes while we were in there. You know, doing those upgrades. And of course, safety, safety, safety. We are always concerned about safety, but it's also on a on another level with childcare centers. So when we're doing any work, we have to go around with uh, metal detectors and making sure there's no you know, screws or brackets or anything that the kids can get to. As you know, they'll put you know anything in their mouth and it, and it can be a choking hazard. So we have to make sure that we're we're very cognizant of that. On top of just your overall um, behavior, you know, you can't be you know cursing like a sailor on 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 the on the job site that some people might normally do. But so we we would have children and educators around. Um, so we have to make sure that we're we're being on our best behavior. And last but not least, you know, food allergens. So if we're having any catering or anything uh, taking place in that that space, we have to make sure there's they're they're adhering to all the food allergens uh, scope that we have. So just kind of an overview, just to give you just really what we did. Uh, this is just including this is not including the seismic project, which I'm sure you can imagine is in the millions of dollars. I'll get to that later. These are all the, the low hanging fruit kind of repair and maintenance projects that we we did uh, over. Uh, Q4 through Q4 2021. So a full year, uh, robust projects, 29 projects in complete, uh, totaling around $275,000 um, to get a lot of these small works done. We we also got very creative. We we wanted to reuse furniture and kind of be as uh, environmentally savvy as possible. So we didn't just go out and throw everything away and, and reuse it. We we tried to repaint, refinish, uh, reuse as much as possible too to be as environmentally conscious as possible. So the highlights, as you can see, we did, uh, you know, final floor upgrades, uh, pinch guard replacements for the doors so uh, the children don't get to their their uh, fingers caught, dishwasher and garbage disposal. Um, as you imagine, I'm sure any facility manager on the call knows that there's quite a bit of user error when it comes to dishwasher and garbage disposal for the end users. So there's a little bit of an education learning curve there, not throwing, uh, you know, uh, grease down the, the pipes or coffee gr grounds. Um, so there's a little bit of a, uh, when, when we installed all that, we had to kind of give them a preface of, hey, let's uh, let's treat these right. So um, along with that, we did window blind replacements, carpet replacements, everything that you would imagine with the soft refresh, uh, soap dispenser, paper towels, um, upgrading our signage, um, even a, a interior cab refresh. Um, some of those, um, you'll see some of these photos later um we're in rough shape very dated 1980s buildings that we, we upgraded with stainless steel to 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 upgrade the aesthetic of the elevator cab so with this as i said we had an opportunity right the opportunity was we were able to get in there we were uh running into a lot of mechanical failure with the garbage disposal and the dishwasher multiple tickets coming in and all we all we did was basically just you know patch patch over the, the problem we didn't really address it because we didn't have a lot of time to go in there so um, when we had, you know, the shutdown, we were able to work with the uh, GCC ops team. And again, going back to that education, making sure that they know how to use the equipment. And, um, you know, this way we could be ahead of the problem, give them fresh equipment with a uh, brand new dishwashers and garbage disposals and knock on wood, if they've been in there for a year, very minimal problems since we've, we've installed this. So we're looking good on uh, the, the less break breakdowns and less plumbing issues over time. And here's just kind of a look at you know the the signage that we put up. We put in some you know nice looking uh, stainless steel uh, dishwashers and some uh, you know pretty powerful garbage disposals to to handle anything that it can throw at throw at it with uh, you know what you can imagine taking place at a childcare center with all you know all the the food and stuff that's going down the drain. 
And here's a, just a little bit of a look of exterior work. You know, there was quite a bit of clutter. We cleaned up uh, the space out, outdoors. As you imagine, children like to throw their toys wherever they want, and we try to keep it as clean as possible and, you know, put in some uh, new, uh, new external uh, exterior flooring out there, some masonry. Um, here's an example of where, oh, oops, sorry about that. Um, here's an example of where um, we always wanted to use what we had. So instead of taking this jungle gym and throwing it away, we, we took it apart, repainted it, and uh, it looks like new. So that was a good opportunity to save what we had. And here's the elevator refresh that I mentioned earlier. As you can tell, very 80s, very, very uh, drab looking. And we were able to upgrade that with some stainless steel upgrade. And something as simple as a parking lot, as you know, it's it's occupied pretty much all day long uh, when we when we had it open 50 weeks a year. So this was a great opportunity to get in there and repave and reseal the parking lot. And another opportunity for environmental savings, um, you know, upgrading to LEDs, and we took away all those uh, incandescent bulbs and were able to upgrade it to LEDs. So another great opportunity. And these are just. Um, very small examples. I have probably 60 before and after photos that I will not bore you guys with, uh, but it will be included in the appendix of this uh, this presentation that will be available uh, after this presentation. Okay, so moving on to the HVAC upgrades. Um, we had quite a bit of old systems at all four of our schools, again, that we would not be able to get in there to do some meaningful work um, to, to upgrade these systems. Uh, combine that with the the uh, the need for clean a cleaner and a sterile air uh, when COVID uh, hit and we were returning to the office we wanted to make sure that we got a very robust system in there to handle um, the, the filtration needs uh, related to to COVID and uh, occupying a building. So with this, um, you you'll see that uh, on each building got an upgrade. the The issue that we ran into, and I'm sure many of the people on this call ran into while they were trying to do projects was, was supply chain um, management. So a lot of our uh, upgrade, a lot of our systems that we were trying to order, we could not get in time because there was just a major, major delay. So we had to get creative. We started going in and uh, doing kind of low hanging preventative maintenance just to get them up and running, uh, you know, adding MERV 13 filters, uh, replacing the barred units, to increase outside air, air and, and filtration. This was a, a band-aid to kind of get us over the finish line while we opened, uh, when we opened back in April, 2021. Um, we are pleased to say that we just completed all four of these. Uh, it took us that long to get everything kind of lined up uh, and all the work was done on nights and weekends to ensure that we did not interfere with the daily operations. So that was a huge win that we were able to get uh, the project over the, the finish line and uh, now they, you know the children can you know uh, comfortably and uh, comfortably breathe uh, filtrated air while they're occupying the building. Along with this, we wanted to make sure that we worked very closely with our Eation S department um, to ensure that we were monitoring air quality, um, and we would uh, routinely go in there and ensure that we were below the recommended thresholds. And this is just a, an example of one of the the tests that came back. So we were very deliberate with how we were uh, measuring the air and making sure that uh, the buildings were operated as safe as possible. And here's just a couple of before and after photos of putting in a fresh air intake before and after. Um, this is one of those, uh, the band-aids that I spoke about just to get us over the finish line while we, we got the new units um, shipped out. And again, another uh, you know barometric relief, uh, you know relieving the pressure in the building, just making sure that we get some fresh air in the building to keep that that balance of indoor and outdoor air um, safe. And some more photos. Again, I have plenty more photos in the appendix that you can go look at at your own leisure, just to see what we did to get our our kind of uh, our our old systems back up and running in the safest way possible. And a couple more photos here for. Uh, just examples of what we did. Okay, and then we have the GCC furniture refresh. Again, uh, as you imagine, um, the wear and tear of children using furniture can uh, become, you know, uh, 
very destructive over time, to, to put it lightly. And uh, we were we took a, a three pronged approach. Um, the first approach was, you know, we have warehouses full of uh, furniture, uh, you know, whether it's office furniture or daycare furniture that like this. So we were really kind of going into our inventory in the warehouses to find something that we can, uh, you know, switch out like for like. So, you know, this was an example where, you know, some of the stuff was beyond the point of uh, reusability, and we, we we did have to dispose of it and replace it like for like. Um, the second prong was refinishing the existing furniture. Uh, unfortunately, I only had the before <laughs> photos here. I was not able to track down the, the after photos, but they were in uh, pretty rough shape. But hey, it's it's a, it's a, it's wood that we we can simply just um, you know sand down and refinish and repaint. So uh, that was a great opportunity to save existing furniture. And then we also have fully replacing furniture, where again some things were just not in the best of shape. They were worn down. They were broken, and we just went out and um, you know. Uh, reacquired some furniture just uh, a like for like uh, replacement and here's the big one the 2020 seismic project that took place at one of our schools it is our largest school located in mountain view uh, built in the 60s there was some seismic uh, recommendations that were um, that were recommended uh, to to bring it up to uh, not to code because we were to code we were um, you know fully fully safe and fully um, able to operate and occupy the space. Uh, as I said before, this was a nice to have that we we kept kind of putting off because, as you as you imagine, trying to displace 160 some odd children uh, to shut down a um, a building for six to eight months would be a major inconvenience to our Googlers. And um, you know, as we we do present this, uh, this is a considered a benefit. Um, you know, so we we had to work with a lot of teams, including the HR team, to to deliver the bad news to the parents that we would be shutting down the, the, the building for six to eight months. So this was a voluntary seismic upgrade. Uh, there were eight buildings in total within the scope, and this required, uh, you know, it, strengthening the wood shear walls, construction of new shear walls, and then just uh, strengthening the structural connections uh, within the building. Um, this also included upgrading the mother's room, doing a, a light refresh for the, uh, the restrooms, ADA improvements, HVAC upgrades, as I mentioned before, paint, carpet, all that fun stuff. So this was, uh, you know, again, not required by the City of Mountain View or the GSA. Um, these were these were our elective um, uh, capability of, um, you know, doing this on our own to make sure that we wanted to uh, run this building in the safest way as possible. Uh, we also uh, did the HVAC um, in uh, conjunction, in parallel during this project. Uh, so we, we could only, we only had to use one uh, general contractor. Um, so this all came in at the price tag of 15 million, um, which it, you know required partnership across multiple stakeholders. So not only the school, um, the administrative staff of the school, the operations team, uh, but you know, getting buy-in from the parents, we had multiple town halls to address their concerns with the, with the HR department of Google um, so that was not a very fun um, message to, de to deliver, and we also gave them a hard deadline. So there was no there was no backing out. So this was uh, kind of a stressful time uh, because we still ran into um, uh, supply chain issues and and labor demand, and you know folks being out sick. Um, so there was there was, it was quite the wild ride, but we did we did meet the um, the deadline and open up the school successfully in time for. Uh, children and educators to take a take a take over. So as you can see, here's the the site map of kind of how large the facility is and how many phases there were. Um, and you know, basically went in, tore down walls, uh, did, redid some shear walls, and this is just kind of a an overview of just how how just disruptive this this project was. There there was, would be no way to do this with with it being occupied even on nights and weekends. And then with that, we had, you know, the, the water was turned off to do the, the the upgrades. We also had a lot of equipment occupying the the lawn, um, so that that in turn killed our our beautiful sod and and green space. So we had to also take uh, take that and replace it. So this is kind of what it looked like before: a lot of dead grass, and uh, replaced it with some fresh green sod to to make it really really sparkle here. 
And here's an example of the mother's room that we upgraded. As you can see, uh, we were kind of just, you know, running along, just trying to figure things out. Here's a, here's a space, we'll throw a, <laughs> throw a chair in there, throw up some privacy curtains. Not exactly the most inviting space. Um, so we were able to take that and really spruce it up, uh, increase the capacity from one to two mothers and, um, you know, have it kind of be more of a tranquil space as you can see in the after photos here. Mm -hmm. And then um, fit up, as you can imagine, as I mentioned before, our backs were up against the wall. Um, we, we basically still had contractors in there a day before children came back. So we had to do fit up in four days, meaning uh, we were working tirelessly throughout the night, nights, weekends, up to you know the, the wee hours of the morning to get this completed. And this was uh, a great accomplishment, not only for the Google team, but the, the Cushman Wakefield uh, facilities management team really, uh, really sh uh, shined throughout this process. Uh, process to get this up and running. So here's just an example of all the stuff that we had to remove and then we had to place back before and after photos of things wrapped, shrink wrapped, and, and keep in mind this stuff was in storage for close to a year, a little longer than a year. So um, there were there were concerns, you know, there were a lot of things where we were unearthing or like dead flowers, maybe someone left a banana in, the, in a, a, a cabinet. So that was not fun, but we were able to go around and kind of clean and tidy everything up and Get everything put back in place. Okay, and so back in April of 2021, um, you know, we were still uh, we had our our internal levels uh, one through five. We were still in level four, which meant that we were only allowing uh, essential workers back into the office. Um, but there was still a need, right? There's still a need that you know these essential workers have have children that they they want to uh, drop off uh, for the day and and uh, utilize that benefit that is their Google benefit. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we work closely with our HR department, our GCC team, our EHS partners, our security partners, and uh, make sure that we open safely as possible in level four back in April of 2021. So this meant that we had to do all of our cleaning at CDC level three, which was you know, daytime in, uh, disinfection for common touch points three times daily. So this was, a, again, a very laborious process three times a day, uh, checking off uh, the, you know, making sure that we were auditing and, and doing this three times a day at uh, 9.30, 12.30, and 3.30 uh, each day. And then on top of that, we had to do a nighttime disinfection once per night. Um, this is all non-toxic, uh, misting, disinfected. And again, this is something, you're going back to all the variables that, that you run into with child care centers, we have to make sure that all, uh, all the chemicals that we're using um, were, were non-toxic, but also very effective at disinfecting. So that was done every single night. Um, and then there was a deep cleaning that took place every Friday after hours. Um, and that means going into every single nook and cranny of each facility. Um, you know, this is on top of our three times a day and also on top of our nighttime misting um, and really just did a deep cleaning every single Friday night. So we could operate this building at the safest way possible. And the approved chemical for disinfecting is called Oxibur, um, and this is for wipe downs and misting. Um, there's, uh, in the appendix, I do have the, um, the MSDS sheets for uh, these chemicals if uh, you're interested in using this uh, disinfectant at your own facility. And then, the, the big day, the return to school. So with the return to school, uh, if you can transport yourself back in time in April 21, we were still very much in a precarious position of what COVID actually was and how we were uh, you know, safely handling it. It was right before the Delta surge um, and about six to eight months before the Omicron surge. So we we're still very much uh, in, the, in the presence of our minds. Um, so we had to make sure that we were very deliberate and cognizant of how we opened. And this included working with our EHS partners to ensure that we have health screenings. Um, so, you know, the parents, educators, and children um, fill up health questionnaires on a daily basis. There were temperature checks every single day. And, uh, you know, uh, protocols in place should um, a child be sick, whether, whether or not it was COVID, if there were any symptoms whatsoever, uh, there was a protocol in place to have isolation rooms and to uh, contact parents should the, the need to um, to take the, the child home. So kind of on the fun side, we wanted to make sure that we we welcomed everyone back, um, you know, with a with our googly uh, approach as we as we like to do anytime we reopen a building. So we had goodie bags with 
you know, um, stickers and uh, snacks and goodies and, and uh, uh, candy and stuff like that. So that was a, a really fun way to uh, welcome everyone back. As you can see in the photo, there's also a no touch tool. So we acquired a lot of these little uh, keychains where you can use it on ATMs or uh, any anything that you needed to touch that you wouldn't want to touch with your hand uh, just to be as safe as possible. And then um, here's a, another picture of the, you know, <laughs> the amount of uh, bags we had to fill up, uh, probably uh, over a thousand bags that we did um, to uh, welcome everyone back. And then there's check-in signage, right? So there, there were a lot of, um, there, there was just a lot of, uh, it was a confusing time. What what do we do? You know, do, do, do I like show up? I, I got to be here at a certain time. I have to get to the office. So we try to make everything as seamless as possible with very um, clear and concise direction, right? So we had the, the family health surveys that were ready ready to go. You could fill out waiting uh, waiting in line with an eight foot distance, uh, making sure that everyone's wearing their, their face covering, that they have their QR code uh, when they filled out their, their survey online, and just making sure that uh, we were operating in the safest way possible. Um, and here's the signage. I mean, this was uh, Santa Clara County was very, uh, you know, uh, intentional about their signage. So we had to follow um, very strict signage laws uh, to, to make sure that we were following all the ordinances, um, you know, elevator capacity, bathroom capacity, uh, social distancing, all that fun stuff was all laid out clear and concise with this signage. And here's another, uh, you know, uh, as you can see before, before we opened up, we had to have signs saying you cannot be accessing this building. We turned off all badge access. Um, and then when we did reopen, we had, we replaced those those scary access to building restricted signs to more welcoming welcome back signs with them um, and, and reactivating all the badge systems to ensure that we had uh, full access to the building. And I'm sure we all remember this. You know, we had to go and and shut off all communal uh, you know drinking fountains. So we went around and uh, you know had to provide bottled water and make sure that any communal drinking fountains were um, you know shut off and not not being able to, to be used. And just an example of what the eight foot distance decals were. So you know um, we every single family showed up, stayed eight feet apart, following these uh, decals on the floor, and uh, you know check in with their um, respective uh, health surveys and get their temperatures taken. And then, um, you know, as, as part of another initiative, we wanted to make sure there was no communal touch points, right? So we put together pencil cases for, you know, office supplies, any, anything that the, the teachers and educators would need. They could just grab, grab and go their, their supplies, um, along with the new touch tool that I previously uh, mentioned. And here's just an example of what, what it looked like when we, when we did reopen. We wanted to make it, you know, going back to the term that we always use, googly. We want to be as googly as possible really welcome everyone back with the uh, with open arms and uh and in as safest way possible so you know got those uh those balloons we don't like to use real balloons although we do have those welcome back to school balloons those are <laughs> those are um not exactly the most um uh environmentally friendly but we are moving away from that so as you can see with those uh plastic balloons that we have that are reusable so we've been trying to really focus on our first day of business um you know, practices to be as environmentally conscious as possible. And then um, here's just an example of a health screening. As you can see, you know, this is the time where we're all wearing, um, you know, face shields, being as safe as possible, even in, in outdoor setting. Um, we did hire a third party uh, company to help us out with the logistics. Um, so they would check everyone in, uh, get their health screenings uh, uploaded, take their temperature, and ensure that they're uh, you know, sanitizing when they enter the building and wearing a mask as they enter the building as well. And just an, another look of one of our other schools uh, you know, with the, the welcome back signage and check-in. And then uh, another you know, opportunity of showing the, the uh, health screening. Uh, again, a lot of moving parts. Um, you know, you, it's early in the morning, you got your, your child who might be cranky. It, it was a lot to to uh to accomplish but uh, i think everything went smoothly um and uh you know the, the googlers were very happy with how uh, deliberate we were with with the check-in and making sure that we were operating in the safest way possible 
And with that, I know that was a, quite a bit to unload. Um, I will make this presentation available uh, through Joshua. Um, he can he can share it out. Um, there are probably a hundred more slides of before and after photos if you want to take a look at that. But I will pause there, hand it over to Joshua, and if there are any questions, I uh, hopefully Joshua or Wayne, um, you know, just let me know if there's any questions uh, that I can answer for you. So I have gotten a few from CFC members um, that have emailed here. Um, I'll try to distill these here. Um, so the first is, I, well, okay. So, uh, so Google, we're wondering, I guess, if uh, we have to make good ROI and sound business cases uh, to our internal uh, stakeholders, <laughs> let's say people that hold the purse strings. And we're, we're wondering, when you were putting this project together, was there an ROI component? And was there a safety versus cosmetic? Uh, I mean, obviously, you, you broke those out, but the, the, the seismic and the other. Um, but did you have to make some kind of a business case for these? Or was it pretty much just an easy sell because you're dealing with children and, and the safety of children? That's a great question. Um, generally speaking, you know, broad strokes on this, ROI was not really a driving factor. You know, this this was something that we needed to, there were there were so many systems that were about to fail because we were not properly maintaining them. So we were kind of doing breakdown maintenance on a lot of these. Um, we weren't doing preventative, we were just doing breakdown. So once it broke, we went in there and, and fixed it. It would disrupt operations. We'd have to do it at night, on the weekends. So long story short, yeah, we just, we just needed to get this stuff done. Um, and, uh, you know, this was an opportunity that we, we had to take advantage of to, to get it completed, not only from a aesthetic standpoint, from an operational mechanical standpoint, and also from a safety standpoint. The next one is kind of related to that. It's, uh, uh, was the list prioritized based on requests from teachers or historical work requests? I guess they mean if, if it's been a problem, did you got, how did you prioritize or was it was it prioritized or was it just, hey, these are all the things we can do, I guess is what they're asking. It was kind of a cornucopia of everything, right? So we had, um, you know, obviously, you know, I, I used the dishwasher and um, garbage disposal as examples. Those things were breaking down left and right, uh, you know, mainly due to user error. Um, but also that was just something that was, you know, we, we've uh, always tracked tickets, making sure that we were addressing issues, uh, but also aesthetically, like, you know, when you're not going in there doing light refreshes like the like we have with um you know buildings where we're able to shut down office buildings maybe relocate staff for a couple of weeks and do a light refresh um with these child care centers we had no redundancy in place so you know there was a lot of stuff that was kind of getting a little shabby and we wanted to make sure that we went in there so yeah again a combination of uh you know the teacher's request but also you put on your fm hat and you walk into some of these facilities and you're like there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to get to get completed. Thank you. Next one is, um, what does daily access look like for contractors and vendors? I, th I think what that may mean is, um, you know, during the construction, I mean, you, you said they obviously had to get all these uh, certifications and go through uh, background checks and so forth. Um, when they still came to site, uh, did they have any special things they had to do? I mean, you know, when you go into an airport and so forth, they might count razor blades uh, in your tools or whatever, that kind of stuff. Was there anything special beyond just the regular COVID protocol that these these uh, contractors had to do? Yeah, you know, outside of what I've already mentioned with the, the, the health screenings, it was a fully secured site um, with uh, our own security guards, uh, you know, 24 seven uh, monitoring the site, not only uh, with on-site presence, but also through cameras. And, and badge access. Um, there, there. I wouldn't say that we were going into, um, you know, counting uh, razor blades and things like that. We um, we did do a sweep, uh, a very thorough sweep, of uh, you know, for any, uh, you know, nails, uh, screws, anything that may have fallen out. But um, day to day, this was a it was a general contractor that we worked with. They had their own safety protocols um, that we made sure that dovetailed with our safety protocols. Um, so they were uh, they, uh, self admittedly every time I went there it was a very tight ship you, you know you had to show up with a QR code check in and you had to check out so you know that there was tracking of everyone who's coming in and out of the facility okay next one is um, how would you have handled if 
uh, if there was no pandemic, would you have crunched it into two weeks and, and just absorbed a significant amount of cost to get it done that way? It cost. I, I hate to say that cost. The cost is always a driving factor, but cost wasn't what was preventing it us to do this. If we could do all what we wanted to do in two weeks and it would cost triple the amount, we would have done, right? Uh, because operations for those facilities are of utmost importance. We can't have any downtime there. Um, the, the problem was we were we wouldn't be able to do any meaningful work within two weeks. So there's just it's just not possible. Um, so yeah, long story short, if we could have done it in two weeks, we would have we would have done it, but I don't want to think about what <laughs> I don't want to think about what our facilities would look like if we did not have this this two-year break uh, of closure because um, it, it was it was getting pretty rough and I think ultimately if we didn't have the pandemic we would probably have to shut school down um, you know methodically one by one just to go in there and do the work so uh, again the silver lining to the pandemic is we were able to get in there while it was closed down. So that this one actually I'm going to interject one of mine here in, into this um, it's, one of the things I, I see consistently and I hear FMs complain about this consistently is that oftentimes you know we're living with choices that design made that uh, practically played out uh, caused a lot of problems for us and cost as FMs. Um, is there any mechanism in place um, where feedback can go to design and say, look, the next one of these things that we build or or hermit crab in or whatever, uh, here's some lessons learned that we can do on the front end to um, give us a longer period of time before upgrades need to be made or um, here's some longer lasting types of units that we can install here or whatever. Is, is there a, a process to to do kind of a lessons learned and, and help uh, inform design? I know sometimes des design, you know, I, I again, I know a lot of great design folks, but I know that the way the way accounting is set up with CapEx and OpEx and the way things are spec and scoped is oftentimes design simply doesn't have an opportunity to get input from facilities. But I'm wondering, is there a mechanism that you guys have to, to give that kind of feedback designed for the next one of these things you build? Yeah, I mean, we have, again, a very robust cross-functional team. So, you know, we, you know, we're just a small sliver. The FM team is just a small sliver of this collaborative effort and we work very extensively with our project management team not only with uh, Cushman Wayfield but internally with our Google project management team that we go back on any project that we close out and do a lessons learned kind of a, a post-mortem on uh, what went right what went wrong um, for something like this you know th the argument could be made of hey why don't you just build a brand new facility and you know make it 600 children and you know just build it from the ground up but um, you know, there's there's a lot of back and forth on on how to approach childcare. You know, whether you contract it out. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned at the beginning, but the, um, all the educators are in house. They're they're all direct employees of Google. Um, this gives us more control and uh, you know uh, ability to uh, give the best curriculum as possible. So it's we have direct oversight on what that looks like, and also um, you know the Googlers uh, you know have trust in the the Google um, kind of ecosystem to provide the best product um, but long story short is you know a lot of these buildings we acquired um, and their existing buildings are old and decrepit um, it, it, decrepit's probably a, a harsh term but they're they're a little old and uh, need a lot of TLC but right now I think we're in a really good spot I feel like we have we have a fresh slate and we should be good to, good to go knock on wood for the next 10 10 or so years before we have to do anything major again and uh, one more here uh, is will the cleaning process uh will the deep cleaning process continue post pandemics i guess it, you, you know you like so many people instituted some new cleaning protocols and so forth um and it is are those do you foresee those remaining in place now that we're winding hopefully winding down on the pandemic and just becoming business as usual um or do you think that's going to get dialed back so we're we follow CDC level guidelines. So I believe we're at CDC level. I, I don't want to say this with exact certainty, but I think we're down to level two. Um, meaning um, there's just different levels that we need to adhere to. Um, I would have to go back to my EHS team on that. I'm not quite sure what we're doing right now, but there there is a possibility that we're just we're we're, we're over doing overkill on this still. But um, yeah, I I, th I think we we generally stick to the CDC level guidelines for 
child care centers specifically. Um, I, I don't believe we're still doing those weekly deep cleans, uh, but it, it is a good practice, um, you know, to, to keep that place as, as clean as possible up to the, the standards that CDC is looking for. Got it. Joshua, did you have anything come in through any of your channels? I do not currently have any questions. But if you do have any questions and you're wondering how to ask, um, there is on your control panel a question box. Simply expand that out and you can type your questions there. Well, Jonathan, this was uh, really informative. I will let everyone know that the uh, we will not only post the, uh, the video link to this as well, the video recording, but we will also post a PDF on the CFC website of this presentation with the very robust appendix, as uh, uh, Jonathan has mentioned. And um, I, I just really want to uh, to thank you, Jonathan, for, for taking the time to do this. And uh, it seems like uh, you and the, uh, the Cushman and Wakefield team, really, you're, you're, both of your teams really worked well together with all the stakeholders to do this. And, and uh, I, I think the project like this is so unique uh, that, uh, it, but it's still, the same lessons can be transferred to any uh, related project in a building is um, whether it's for kids or whether it's just for a, a regular TI or something like that. It's it's really shows that when teams pull together and there's good organization, good project management, um, and uh, everyone's working in the same direction that uh, some great things can happen. So uh, kudos on, on uh, what looks to be a very successful project. Thank you, Wayne, and thank you for having me. And I think this is, it's just, it, it, it's crazy that two years have flown by and how much we've done in two years. And it's just been a, it's been a pleasure to, to provide these services to our, our Google Child Care Centers. We had one last minute. I actually minute have question. a question before we close out. Sorry to interrupt. We have a question did get slipped in. Yep. Um, and it's a good one. It says, has Google considered any bipolar ionization for greater indoor air quality? That is a fantastic question. I did not even address that. So thanks for calling that out. Um, on top of our, our MERV 13s that we have uh, for filtration, we do have ionization uh, air purifiers scattered throughout the facilities. So um, we do take that um, very, um, very importantly to make sure that we have the best air quality in the, in the building. Excellent. Well, with that, we will we will close it down. Thank you, everyone. Um, please go to the CFC website for any information. And uh, Jonathan, once again, thank you so much for uh, for participating here and, and uh, for some great content. We appreciate it. Thank you.